Hi, welcome back to another episode of Thinking Inside the Box on Noah's Ark. So today we're going to talk about vinyl records and how they store and reproduce music. And at the end of the video, I'm going to touch a little bit about um, how to make sure your music is ready for uh, vinyl and how to kind of master vinyl. Vinyl records weren't the first uh, medium to store music. In fact, they were preceded by something called the wax cylinders and shellac records. And um, it's arguable, but vinyl records were one of the most successful uh, storage medium for music in the history of recorded music. And I can see uh, two different reasons why. Well, first of all, the fact that the product is not just about the music, it's also about the artwork and the, the beauty of the packaging that contributes to uh, the popularity of the records still today. You actually own a physical product and a piece of recorded music in your hands, and that is a big selling point. But the second point is that, well, this is obviously an ongoing debate, but is the sound quality of a vinyl record better than uh, modern, you know, digital uh, distributions, such as, you know, on CD and MP3s and, and things like that. The vinyl record arguably has a better sound reproduction quality because it's a purely analog storage medium, whereas CDs and MP3s are, um, are actually digitally stored, so the data is different. One is continuous and the other one is discrete, so the way the waveform is reconstructed is a little different. So let's take a look at different vinyl record formats now and compare kind of the properties between these. So you have three different sizes of records out there. You have uh, the small seven inch one, which looks like this one. And then in between you have a 10 inch record, which I don't have right now. And then you have a bigger one, which is a 12 inch record, which is the one you're probably most familiar with, which is this size. And you also have a combination of three different rotation speeds, um, calculated RPM, revolutions per minute or rotations per minute. And so you have 33.3 RPM, 45 and 78. And usually the combinations of these are the seven inch rotates at 45, the 12 inch at 33.3 and the 10 inches at 78. So obviously all these parameters determine how much music you can put on the record and the length of the music that can be stored. And this is actually not a fixed standard. So it's up to the mastering engineer or cutting engineer to decide how much music the engineer wants to squeeze in to uh, the record because you can make the grooves closer or farther away from each other. And that is a compromise between the length of the record and the loudness of the music. So the closer the grooves are uh, to each other, well, the more revolution or the more rotation you get on a record. So that means the length of music is extended, right? But since the grooves are closer to each other, it has less space to carve the grooves so the grooves are going to be narrow and, and less deep. So that means the music is going to be a little quieter. Uh, whereas if you have the grooves more separated between each other, well, then you can carve much more into uh, the record and you can have wider grooves and that makes the music louder. But that means that you can put less uh, grooves on the record and that uh, diminishes the length of the music on that side. As a, as a rule of thumb, the um, the LP, as some people call it, or long play, is the 12 inch 33.3 RPM. And this one holds roughly 25 minutes of music. Whereas the EP or the extended play, as some people call it, is the seven inch at 45 RPM. Well, this holds roughly 12 minutes of music. And then you have the SP or standard play, which is the 10 inch at 78 RPM. And that one holds actually only three minutes of music. And this is why a lot of earlier hit records uh, had to be um, shorter than three minutes so that they could be squeezed onto that 10 inch SP record. So over the course of recording history, there was a fundamental change that occurred when vinyl records were switched from the monophonic uh, version to the stereo version. And this change was made possible by none other than Alan Blumlein, the inventor of stereo recording at Abbey Road Studios. So to understand the differences between the mono and the stereo styles, let's take a look at the microscopic level uh, of the grooves and the needle and see how the needle changes 
those mechanical uh, signals into electric signals. So a monostylus essentially is constrained into one dimension of movement, which is the lateral movement, left and right. So the grooves are basically parallel to each other all the time and symmetrical. And so the frequencies of the waves and curves are the actual uh, waveforms that are going to be reproduced uh, when played back. On the other hand, a stereo stylus has two dimensions of movement. Now, it has, as before, the left and right lateral movement, but now it has also the vertical up and down movement. And so the grooves are going to be now asymmetrical whenever the signal is not monophonic. And so for a perfectly in-phase signal, uh, the movement is going to be lateral, left and right, as before. But for a signal that's completely out of phase, the movement is going to be vertical, up and down. So this is where base frequencies and out of phase signals um, come into the picture and cause problems. You may have heard people say uh, to keep the base frequencies in the middle or center of the mix or you know, check for out of phase signals. Well, this is due to the fact that the base frequencies have bigger and longer uh, physical waveforms, right? So the grooves are going to be longer and bigger. And this makes the needle more susceptible to slip and skip outside of the record. On the other hand, uh, out of phase signals, as we saw, make vertical movements. So this means that that may make the needle jump out of the record and that causes problems as well. So to prevent these types of problems and you know, elongate the running time and protect the storage medium, well, there's a special EQ curve that's applied uh, both when the music is carved onto the record and also when the music is played back. And this phono EQ curve is called the RIAA curve. And so basically what happens is that when the music is carved onto the vinyl, an EQ curve is applied where the bass frequencies are cut off and the high frequencies are boosted. Now, <clears throat> the music is engraved with those uh, characteristics. And what happens is that when the record is played back, the inverse EQ curve is applied and so the bass frequencies are boosted and the highs are cut off. And this allows uh, to prevent some of the problems we've discussed earlier. So most amplifiers and turntables nowadays have a, a phono input or preamp integrated in these. So you, you don't need to worry about that. But some people experience a very thin uh, sound on playback. And this is because the turntable or uh, the amplifiers are actually plugged from uh, their regular inputs and outputs. And this means that the correction EQ curve is not applied on playback. So you get the natural raw sound from the vinyl record, which has the, obviously the bass cut off and the highs uh, boosted. So as a mastering engineer or someone who wants to produce music uh, on vinyl and you, you hope to distribute music on vinyl, there are two points that you can uh, be careful on. So the first point is you can sum the bass frequencies into mono up to a certain frequency. So let's say you can sum all the frequencies up to 50 hertz so that there's no bass frequency in the side signal. Also, what you can do is you can check that there are not a lot of out of phase content in your music by checking phase meter or correlation meter to make sure there's no you know, dangerous frequencies uh, that could make the needle pop out of the record. So these are some of the measures that you can take to uh, make sure your music is fit for vinyl. So that's it. I hope you liked my introduction to vinyl records. And if you like this video, please hit the like button and share this video on your social media. That would really help me grow this channel. And let me know in the comment section below if you want to see more of these types of videos. And as usual, please subscribe to my channel and I'll see you next time. Also, as some of you may have seen, I've started a Patreon page and I'm gonna put a link in the description below so that you can check that out. And I've made these vinyl record Noah's Ark stickers that are gonna be on sale. And also you can receive these for free if you sign up on Patreon as a patron. So thank you so much for your support and I hope I can bring much more interesting content in the future. And um, thanks for watching. Get who I am I 
心。